Chapter Six of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The two parties unite. It was indeed a discouraging situation that Major Henry faced that day, for it seemed that his business venture with General Ashley had been doomed to failure from the very beginning. The series of misfortunes, as we have seen had begun before his northbound expedition of the preceding spring had passed beyond the limit of the states near fort osage in the state of missouri a keelboat with all its cargo had gone to the bottom of the river then on the last lap of the arduous journey to the yellowstone he had lost his horses to the assabonis only recently he had returned from his defeat by the blackfeet in the region of the great falls to his post near the junction of the rivers determined to push on again as soon as the second party should join him with this in view he had sent an express to ashley with the news of his urgent need and now came these riders from ashley asking help of one who had been unable to help himself such are the occasional ironies of circumstance that sometimes make misfortune seem a mysterious and malevolent personality henry moved with characteristic promptness leaving twenty of his men in possession of the post he set out by keel boat next morning with the balance of his party jed and baptiste went with him of all the primitive modes of travel none is more delightful than the downstream drifting when the june floods run and now the distant mountains were feeding the river with their melting snows when the winds are light or blow astern this means of overcoming distance is the next best thing to standing on a magic carpet and wishing the miles away a great calm had followed the wide sweeping rains and the keelboat kept the boiling current like a conscious being well aware of its trail through the slow lapse of the june days the men had nothing to do but to smoke and tell yarns the story of the blackfoot battle was told and retold until the latest version was scarcely to be regarded as a collection of related individual accounts but rather as a rudimentary work of art whose author was the whole group consciousness this gentle art of lying the alleged passing of which was once eloquently bemoaned by oscar wilde reached a high degree of development among the wandering bands of the early west but lying is far too harsh a word rather let us call it the process of finding a thread of reason running through the apparent unreasonableness of circumstance of making beauty by the simple means of shifting the relationship between facts that in themselves appear unbeautiful thus do men seek to put their world in order about them that life may still be understandable and dear and there was another story that henry's men did not weary of telling from many angles and with many side lights during the idle days of drifting already the tale had taken artistic form under the manipulation of the group consciousness though it had not yet reached the final rounded version in which it would become familiar throughout the wilderness wherever two men might share the warmth of smouldering embers it was the story of fink carpenter and talbot only recently these men had seen its climax yet already it was charged with something of the remoteness and the mystery of doom there were those who remembered the old days on the ohio and the mississippi when the mutual love of the three boatmen was a byword in all the river ports fink was a wild irishman a famous joker and a terrible fighter with the body of a hercules and a face that suggested a bulldog men laughed freely at his jokes in those good old days for it was well known that whoever neglected to laugh must be prepared for instant battle carpenter was tall slenderly but powerfully built and a blonde he smiled much talked little and fought well with a show of good nature that was disconcerting talbot was a small man but one who had once seen the three fight their way through a crowded dance hall on the lower mississippi spoke highly of the little man's terrier-like effectiveness in a scrimmage fink and carpenter were expert marksmen and often each would shoot a whiskey cup from the other's head at the distance of forty yards by way of demonstrating both their skill and their faith in each other these three cronies had joined henry's expedition on the preceding year and had spent the winter with nine other men among the blood indians at the mouth of the mussel shell there fink and carpenter had fallen out at last over a half-breed girl 
and had come to blows despite the desperate efforts of Talbot to pacify them. The fight that followed was stubborn and long, but Carpenter had won, owing less to his strength and skill, perhaps, than to his coolness. Fink was not the man to forgive, and he had never before known defeat. Spring came, the mussel-shell party returned to the fort near the mouth of the Yellowstone, and there the quarrel was renewed. Once more Talbot strove to pacify his friends, and with apparent success. At the little man's suggestion, the two big men agreed to join in the old rite of friendship, the shooting of the cup. A coin was tossed for the first shot, which fell to Fink. Now calling Talbot aside, Carpenter willed his gun, flint, powder-horn, knife and blankets to the little man, who laughingly accepted the bequest, remarking that Fink couldn't miss a target if he tried. Whether or not Fink missed his target was still a question among the tellers of the tale. What he hit was a spot between the eyes of his old friend. So in the enforced idleness of the downstream journey, the men whiled away the hours by spinning yarns looped yarns wherein the veteran spinners vied to color with a lie more glorified some thread that had veracity enough spun straightway out of life's own precious stuff that each had scutched and heckled in the raw and often in the nights of drifting when the men lay huddled together on deck gazing at the stars or watching the shadowy shore forge slowly to the rear some french voyageur would strike up a well-known tune on a fiddle setting the band to singing and causing the wolves and coyotes to yip and yammer along the bluffs and once major henry himself who loved the violin and handled it with considerable skill played a weird air that sobbed like a woman yet was very sweet to hear somehow and the men were silent marveling that he who played there in the starlight was the same henry whom they had seen calm in battle and of whom so many tales of daring were told it was near the end of the third week in june when the party having drifted by the mouth of the cannonball river began to dread the passing of the re towns and all tales were forgotten in the general discussion of that coming event there were those who pointed out how the high bluff above the upper village and at the foot of which the main current then ran would be swarming with indians prepared to rake the keelboat's deck with plunging fire and others saw the wooded island below the lower village belching rifle smoke and impossible to pass and what of the four hundred yards of pickets between those two strategic points over and over the imagined battle was fought but when in mid-afternoon of the next day the keelboat swept about a right-hand bend and swirled down a westward stretch with the upper Ree town to starboard while the men gripped their cocked rifles nothing serious happened dogs barked villagers crowded on the lodge tops and a band of unarmed braves running down the beach signaled with buffalo robes by way of indicating their keen desire to trade and their very benevolent intentions but the keelboat swept on with the strong june current and soon the babble of the towns had died out astern having drifted all night long at sunset of the following day the party came to ashley's camp near the mouth of the cheyenne we may be sure that there was great talk that night about the fires and though the dominant theme was defeat the glare of the embers revealed the weathered faces of many who were destined to great victories at this distance in time the light upon their features is dim but the memory of their achievements is like a torch flaring in a gloom for those who are familiar with that period first of all there was andrew henry whose adventures in the region of the three forks and beyond the great divide lead one back to the days of Manuel Lisa and the men of Lewis and Clark. Near him sat Ashley, whose future explorations on the upper waters of the Colorado would fix his name in our history. Yonder was James Bridger, a lad of nineteen years, who would be the first to look upon Great Salt Lake, and whose career, then just beginning, would outlast the fur trade and the Sioux wards, ending peacefully nearly sixty years later on a Missouri farm the powerfully built gray-bearded man was hugh glass the memory of whose amazing adventures would preserve for posterity the record of henry's important westbound expedition in the fall of that year yonder sat fitzpatrick soon to be widely known among the tribes of the west as the chief of the withered hand and not far away was etienne provost both of these have been credited with the discovery of south pass 
but the former was doubtless the first white man to travel through that important gateway to the land beyond the rockies in the glow of another fire sat william l sublette a tall man with blue eyes sandy hair and a roman nose he would be the first to take wagons to the mountains over the great natural road later to be known as the oregon trail here was edward rose yonder david jackson and louis vasquez names to conjure with in those days of mighty men but more important than any yet named was the slender taciturn man of twenty-five who had just returned from his hazardous journey to the yellowstone he would be the first to travel the great central route to the pacific the first american to reach california by land these men with many others who talked about the fires that night and are now forgotten were the real explorers of the west between the route of lewis and clark and the northern boundary of new mexico and arizona during the next two decades this body of men would scatter over the whole trans-missouri country during that evening general ashley and major henry decided to move the united parties downstream to the mouth of the teton there to wait for the reinforcements that they hoped would be sent upstream by the military authorities at fort atkinson during jedediah smith's absence the keelboat yellowstone had dropped downstream to atkinson bearing the seriously wounded men of ashley's command and a message from the defeated general to colonel leavenworth then commander of that post coincident with the arrival of the keelboat at the fort the tragic tale of another disaster to american traders came from prior's fork of the yellowstone there in may jones and immel who as we have seen had set out in advance of henry in the spring of eighteen twenty two had encountered a superior number of hostile blackfeet and had been killed together with five of their men the loss of property was reckoned at fifteen thousand dollars a large sum in those days moved by this accumulation of misfortune leavenworth acted promptly and was now already pushing northward to punish the rees and to render the riverway safe for american traders and trappers during the next day after the arrival of henry's party at the mouth of the cheyenne jedediah smith with one companion started out on another journey being chosen to take to st louis the furs that henry's men had collected during the previous fall and spring one of the most striking facts in this man's short and wonderful career was his ceaseless activity his entry into the fur trade may be likened to a plunge into an irresistible current that should bear him swiftly and far and from which the release could only be through death alone such facts in human lives are not to be regarded as matters of chance but rather as manifestations of temperament curious capable fearless and self-contained smith was never the man to wait for events he went forth eagerly to meet them such ever are the splendid wayfarers of this world end of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Leavenworth Campaign. On June twenty second, that is to say, at about the time when Major Henry reached the mouth of the Cheyenne, Colonel Leavenworth had started north from Fort Atkinson with six companies of the Sixth United States Infantry, consisting of two hundred twenty men three keelboats including the yellowstone sent down by ashley and two six-pound cannon five days later joshua pilcher of the missouri fur company with sixty trappers and two keelboats upon one of which a small howitzer was mounted overtook the military expedition and joined forces with it on july sixth another keelboat was procured from a descending party of trappers owing to the very high water and continuous headwinds the advance of the combined parties was slow during the night of the eighth of july a terrific storm of wind and rain such as all prairie dwellers know drove the yellowstone from her moorings and wrecked her on a sandbar where all night long in the violent downpour her crew struggled to save her cargo from the raging river once again as the more superstitious voyageurs were doubtless not slow to note it was ashley's property that had been chosen for misfortune plainly luck was no friend to the general two days were lost in hauling the keelboat ashore and repairing it on july nineteenth the expedition arrived at fort recovery 
situated on the island that lies opposite the present town of Oakoma, South Dakota, and there two small bands of Yankton and Teton Sioux joined the whites. Nine days later, the forces under Leavenworth were further increased by two hundred Saoni and Unkpapa Sioux, who had reasons of their own for wishing to move against the Rees under circumstances apparently so favorable. The last day of the month was spent in waiting for another large band of Sioux Indians, who had sent runners to announce their intention of joining the expedition. It was not until the 1st of August that Leavenworth reached the camp of Ashley and Henry, who, having succeeded in procuring a supply of horses from the Sioux at the mouth of the Teton, had moved on a short distance downstream, intending to proceed overland to the Yellowstone if the military forces failed to arrive within a reasonable time. There were now but eighty men in their party, and these were placed at the disposal of Colonel Leavenworth, who proceeded at once to organize the motley collection of fighting men under his command into a military body. The result was styled the Missouri Legion. During the first week of August, the progress of the expedition was considerably retarded by the whims of the Indian allies, some of whom were inclined to indulge in dog feasts while the United States Army waited in advance, and others in large numbers insisted on being ferried across the river now and then, an operation costing considerable time and effort. However, on the 8th of August, the Legion, being then at a point twenty-five miles below the Reed Towns, succeeded at last in getting together, and the general advance began. Considering the time, the place, and the strength of the foe, it was truly a formidable force that Colonel Leavenworth viewed that day, and it must have made a pretty show as it moved northward. One hundred forty long-haired and bearded trappers, in the picturesque semi-savage garb of the wilderness, two hundred twenty United States regulars in army blue, four hundred Sioux Indians, splendid in war paint and feathers, about half of them armed with bows, lances, and war clubs, and in addition to these, a fleet of six keel boats. Surely now the Rees were about to pay dearly for their treachery. At sunset the Legion went into camp, ten miles nearer to its objective, and early in the morning of the ninth it was on the march again. During the day, says the Colonel in his report to the War Department, we continually received the most strange and contradictory accounts from our Indians. It appeared that there were several Sioux living with the Arikaras, and who had intermarried with them. They were sent for, to come out and see their friends, who were coming, as the Sioux said, to smoke and make peace with the Arikaras. Some said that the villages were strongly fortified, and furnished with ditches as deep as a man's chin when standing in them. At other times it was said that the Arikaras were so confident that the Sioux were coming to make peace with them, that they had taken down their defenses, and that there was nothing to defend them but their dirt lodges. Nothing appeared certain but that the Arikaras were still in their villages. These contradictory stories, which were told by the Sioux, had the effect to create suspicions of their fidelity. It was also reported, and there was too much reason to believe it true, that the Saonis and Unkpapas, who were combined, had determined, in case we were defeated, to join the Arikaras. Surely a military commander has seldom been placed in a more precarious situation than that of Leavenworth and to make matters worse, it became more and more apparent that Joshua Pilcher was concerned far less with the success of Leavenworth's expedition than with the failure of Ashley's enterprise. Through a wily Frenchman of his party, one Simoneau, who seems to have been the only interpreter available to Leavenworth in his relations with the Sioux, Pilcher evidently left nothing undone that might increase his own prestige with the Indian allies, at the same time discrediting Ashley and embarrassing the unfortunate colonel. The following incident of the advance, as told by Leavenworth in his official report, is typical. Mr. Pilcher soon came to me with an Indian, whom he reported to be an Arikara, and said that he had delivered himself up and claimed protection. I dismounted and disarmed the Indian, and placed him under guard, and gave his arms to a Sioux who was destitute. It afterwards appeared that Major Pilcher's Arikara prisoner was a Sioux who belonged to the Major's command. It can scarcely be questioned that the Sioux very soon came to regard the whole affair as rather a lark, 
and the white soldiers as the butt of a good joke at no time was colonel leavenworth able to control them having been placed on the flanks of the advancing force with instructions to keep those positions they were soon out of sight in the direction of the villages when about three miles from their objective the soldiers heard brisk firing ahead and soon met some sioux returning pell-mell with a few captured re-horses at this juncture pilcher turned up with a report that the enemy had met the sioux near the villages and had not only maintained their ground against the sioux but had driven them back he therefore insisted that it was highly important to press forward one or two companies to support the sioux or the consequences would probably be prejudicial the soldiery immediately set out on a run and soon the legion was within striking distance of the foe but when the men were deployed in battle formation nothing happened owing to the unfortunate fact that the unruly indian allies were ahead and obstructed the line of fire the enemy now withdrew into the villages and the sioux who had succeeded in killing a few rees decided that the proper moment had arrived for playing the not too edifying game of white bear this consisted so the colonel tells us of placing the skin of that animal over the shoulders of a sioux who walked upon his hands and knees and endeavored to imitate the bear in his motions by walking around and smelling the dead bodies sometimes he would cut off small pieces of the flesh and eat it by the time the sioux had tired of their game and when the keelboats had at last arrived with the artillery night was approaching and the colonel decided to postpone further operations until the next day august tenth the great day arrived but when the soldiers and trappers had taken advantageous positions about the towns it was remarked that our indian allies were very much scattered in the rear however the artillery opened fire the first shot killed the great reed chief gray eyes and the second brought down the reed medicine pole this seemed a very good beginning indeed a party under major ketchum was now ordered to advance and did so until ordered to halt being then within three hundred yards of the lower village it occurred to the major that the guns of his heroes had been loaded for a considerable time and that it was desirable to discharge them the guns not the heroes the guns were thereupon fired with what effect we are not told at this juncture leavenworth became convinced that it would be well to examine the reed defences thanks to a certain mr macdonald who had spent some time in the villages it was mr macdonald's opinion that the defences were so strong and the reeds so confident in their strength that in case an assault were made every squaw would count her coup that is kill a man with a view to ascertaining the strength of the fortifications continues the colonel i thought of making an assault upon an acute angle of the upper town which i could approach within one hundred steps under cover of a hill accordingly major ketchum was ordered to advance general ashley with his command trappers was also ordered to advance he did so in the most gallant manner he promptly took possession of a ravine within twenty steps of the lower town and maintained a spirited action well calculated to assist us in our design upon the upper town by making a diversion in our favor by this time however the mood of the sioux seems to have dwindled from martial to bucolic for when all other things were ready complains the sorely tried colonel i was mortified exceedingly to learn from mr pilcher that no assistance could be obtained from the sioux in consequence of their being so deeply engaged in gathering corn in the fields of the rees one can scarcely blame them for it was the time of roasting years the eating of which they naturally found much more pleasurable than fighting leavenworth thereupon decided not to proceed with the examination of the enemy defences for having gained the desired information he would be compelled to fall back under cover of the hill there to organize the attack and the sioux being likely to mistake the strategic maneuver for defeat might join the rees furthermore some of the enemy at this time created a counter diversion by issuing from the towns and occupying a ravine in the rear of our men on the hill so the reconnaissance failed leavenworth now went in search of pilcher and found him and his men lying in a hollow behind the hill after some conversation with the leisurely gentleman 
the colonel decided to direct simoneau to go as near the village as he could with safety hail the arikaras and tell them they were fools not to come out and speak with the whites simoneau hailed the rees twice and then said the wind blew so hard he could not make himself heard whereupon the colonel remarked that it was a matter of no consequence in the meanwhile both the upper and lower villages had been receiving a desultory shelling from the six-pounders and the howitzer but upon learning that only thirty-nine rounds of ammunition remained the colonel commanded the artillery to cease firing in order to save the remaining shot for a general assault upon the towns which he planned to make then he notified the sioux still hotly engaged with the serried ranks of corn that he wished them to withdraw they obeyed owing no doubt to the fact that they had gathered all the roasting ears they could carry both ketchum and ashley were recalled from their advanced positions and a party was organized to invade the enemy's cornfields to obtain subsistence for our men several of whom particularly general ashley's command had not had any provisions for two days the colonel having every reason to believe that the assault upon the armies of the green corn would be prosecuted with conspicuous gallantry retired to the cabin of his keelboat probably to meditate in quiet upon his victories it was now mid-afternoon very soon afterwards he tells us mr pilcher came into my cabin and apparently with great alarm informed me that captain riley was attacked i was very glad to hear it and immediately went out to send him support but behold captain riley and all our men were very quietly coming in without the least knowledge of any attack being made upon them mr pilcher remarked that this report was unfortunately too much like the case of his arikara prisoner an hour later while conferring with general ashley concerning operations that were to follow leavenworth saw a sioux and an arikara holding a conversation on the plain in front of the villages he sent for pilcher and told him that the sioux and rees were holding a parley and asked him to go and see to it pilcher moved off with his interpreter simoneau toward the place indicated then casting my eye up the hills in our rear continues the colonel's report i discovered that they were covered with the retreating sioux and i soon had reason to know that they were all going off i immediately mounted my horse and went after mr pilcher to be present at the parley with the sioux and arikaras the rees now asked pity for their women and children and said they did not want to be fired upon any more gray eyes who had caused all the mischief was dead the reed chiefs wished to talk and make peace leavenworth was quite ready to talk and the chiefs came do with us as you please said they but do not fire any more guns at us we are all in tears the colonel replied that they must make up general ashley's losses and give up five principal men of their tribe as a guarantee of good conduct in the future the chiefs agreed to restore everything possible their horses had been taken by the sioux and killed in great numbers they had no horses to give but they would return all the guns they could find and the articles of property they had received from general ashley they would even return the hats also they would give five of their number as hostages accordingly a treaty was signed but not by the principal chiefs of the tribe as pilcher with some asperity pointed out to the colonel as to general ashley's property three rifles one horse and sixteen buffalo robes were returned when the hostages arrived leavenworth refused to receive them as they were evidently men of no importance thus the farce went on pilcher constantly playing at cross purposes with the colonel until during the night of the twelfth of august the rees fled from their villages all except one feeble old squaw the mother of the dead chief gray eyes there was now nothing left for leavenworth to do but to march away during the night of his departure contrary to his orders the towns were fired by parties unknown though suspicion seemed to point to certain men of the missouri fur company on the twenty third of august pilcher then at fort recovery addressed the following letter to colonel leavenworth i am well aware that humanity and philanthropy are mighty shields for you against those who are entirely ignorant of the disposition and character of the indians but with those who have experienced the fatal and ruinous consequences of their treachery and barbarity these considerations will avail nothing 
you came to restore peace and tranquillity to the country and to leave an impression which would ensure its continuance your operations have been such as to produce the contrary effect and to impress the different tribes with the greatest contempt for the american character you came to use your own language to open and make good this great road instead of which you have by the imbecility of your conduct and operations created and left impassable barriers so ended the first campaign of the united states army against the indians of the plains the forces under leavenworth's command including the trappers and the sioux had numbered slightly over one thousand the re villages at that time contained about seven hundred warriors and something over three thousand old men squaws and children two white men had been wounded and two of the sioux killed while the rees had lost no more than thirty some of whom were women and children the cost of the campaign to the united states government was computed at two thousand thirty eight dollars twenty four cents it was a gilbert and sullivan opera without the rhymes and the music pilcher playing the role of the heavy villain but perhaps colonel leavenworth should not be too greatly blamed for the fiasco his conduct at the battles of chippewa and niagara falls in the war of eighteen twelve amply proves that he had no lack of courage and we have george catlin's word for it that the manner of his death some years later was noble in his campaign against the rees he was the victim of commercial rivalry nevertheless one wonders what might have been the result if an officer like crook had been in command or custer fancy pilcher or any other man playing at ducks and drakes with him who humbled the cheyenne on the washita and died with all his men on the bluffs along the little bighorn End of chapter 7chapter eight of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf westward by the grand now that the re campaign was over general ashley returned to st louis and major henry with an inadequate number of horses that had been purchased from the sioux set out by way of the grand river valley for his post at the mouth of the yellowstone jedediah smith who had but recently returned from st louis accompanied the expedition two hundred men had gone north in the two ashley henry parties of eighteen twenty two and eighteen twenty three and now in mid-august of the latter year the number had dwindled to one hundred counting those left by henry at the mouth of the yellowstone but hardship and calamity had tested these the frailer spirits had been eliminated by natural selection and it was the pick of the fur trade that rode away from the missouri in the waning summer thus the resistance of the rees that in itself might seem an insignificant episode is raised to a position of historical importance when viewed in relation to the westward race movement for that tribe of savages had acted as the principal agent in a sifting process out of which should come sturdy spirits fit to lead the van of the aryan peoples on the last lap of the long journey from mesopotamia to where the sun goes down in the pacific however it was not as conscious forerunners of civilization that these men went forth and that they should ever be regarded as benefactors of the human race could not have occurred to the generality of them the two great forces that have caused all folk wanderings impelled them the economic urge and the perennial human curiosity that is basic in the love of adventure the leaders with the single exception of jedediah smith were doubtless in their own estimation merely traders and trappers out for the precious beaver pelts with which to buy what no man ever purchased at a price happiness and the rank and file receiving from one hundred fifty to three hundred dollars per year were lured on by the witchery of danger and the free life of the wilderness their heroism was a mere by-product yet it alone has enriched the race while the beaver fur that seemed all-important at the time has returned to dust in lord jim joseph conrad has the following passage which though it refers to wanderers on the seven seas is peculiarly applicable to these early explorers of the far west to us their less tried successors they appear magnified not as agents of trade 
but as instruments of a recorded destiny pushing out into the unknown in obedience to an inward voice to an impulse beating in the blood to a dream of the future our common human nature may be greater than we know were it possible for us now to look backward unaided by the imagination and glimpse with the naked eye those eighty men pushing westward in the broiling day amid the dust kicked up by the sweating pack animals we would probably consider them somewhat grotesque in appearance some of those who had come up with ashley that spring were still clad in the garb of civilization sadly in need of patches others of the same band had already been forced to discard a portion of their original clothing and now wore an incongruous combination of indian and white man's clothing those who had wintered at the mouth of the yellowstone had long since shed the clothes with which they had started from st louis and having adopted the whole indian costume with the exception perhaps of a blue cotton shirt procured from the keel boats could scarcely be distinguished at a distance of a hundred yards from the wild natives many of these wore deerskin leggings that left the hips and thighs bare save for a cloth that was folded around the loins and tucked under the girdle from this girdle were suspended leather bags containing hunting knife hatchet flint and steel pipe and tobacco or any smaller articles of personal use which in the jargon of the trapper were known as fixins or possibles a buckskin belt slung over the left shoulder and under the right arm carried the ammunition for the long muzzle-loading rifle very colored fringes embroideries done in beads and hair dyed feathers and a variety of other savage ornaments set off this strange attire some were still wearing boots and shoes but most either through necessity or whim had adopted the moccasin wrought of a single piece of dressed buckskin sewed from heel to ankle with deer sinew and gathered from toe to instep large red or blue cotton handkerchiefs tied in the shape of a turban served most of these men for headgear but however hit and miss these men might appear there was nothing haphazard about the manner of their progress for as a result of his experience in the wilderness major henry had worked out a complete technique for the moving of bodies of men through hostile indian country the organization of the band the duties of each unit the order of march and the method of making camp were as much a matter of rigid plan as was the case with a roman legion under caesar general ashley has left us the following account of such arrangements in the organization of a party say from sixty to eighty men four of the most confidential and experienced of the number are selected to aid in the command the rest are divided into messes of eight or ten a suitable man is also appointed at the head of each mess whose duty it is to make known the wants of his mess receive supplies for them make distributions watch over their conduct enforce orders etc the party thus organized each man receives the horses and mules allotted to him their equipage and the packs which his mules are to carry every article so disposed of is entered in a book kept for that purpose when the party reaches the indian country great order and vigilance in the discharge of their duty are required of every man a variety of circumstances confines the march very often to the borders of large water courses when that is the case it is found convenient and safe when the ground will admit to locate our camps which are generally laid off in a square so as to make the river form one line and include as much ground in it as may be sufficient for the whole number of horses allowing for each a range of thirty feet in diameter on the arrival of the party at their camping place the position of each mess is pointed out where their packs saddles etc are taken off and with these a breastwork is immediately put up to cover them from night attack by indians the horses are then watered and delivered to the horse guards who keep them on the best grass outside and near the encampment where they graze until sunset then each man brings his horses within the limits of the camp exchanges the light halter for the other more substantial one sets his stakes which are placed at a distance of thirty feet from each other and secures his horses to them this range of thirty feet in addition to the grass the horse has collected outside the camp 
will be sufficient for him during the night after these regulations the proceedings for the night are pretty much the same as are practiced in military camps at daylight when in dangerous parts of the country two or more men are mounted on horseback and sent to examine ravines woods hills and other places within striking distance of the camp where indians might secrete themselves before the men are allowed to leave their breastworks to make the necessary morning arrangements for the march when these spies report favorably the horses are taken outside the camp delivered to the horse guard and allowed to graze until the party has breakfasted and are ready for saddling in the line of march each mess takes its choice of position in the line according to its activity in making ready to move the mess first ready to march moves up in the rear of an officer who marches in the front of the party and takes its choice of position and so they all proceed until the line is formed in that way they march the whole of that day spies are sent out several miles ahead to examine the country in the vicinity of the route and others are kept at the distance of half a mile or more from the party as the lay of the ground seems to require in front in rear and on the flanks in making discoveries of indians they communicate the same by signals or otherwise to the commanding officer who makes his arrangements accordingly in this manner the band had moved two days up the grand river making fairly good time in spite of the fact that most of the men were afoot the horses purchased from the sioux being needed for the packs of merchandise brought up in ashley's keel boats it yet lacked two hours until sunset when weary with the long day's journey in the broiling sun the party rounded a bend and saw a little way ahead a lone horse unsaddled and tethered peacefully nipping the lush grass of a pleasant knoll that flanked the stream sitting near by a gray-bearded powerfully built man was leisurely skinning a buck deer from the lower limbs of a neighboring tree hung three antelope already dressed a cheer went up from the hungry men in the van and running down the column set the pack horses nickering the old man was hugh glass the chief hunter of the party whose duty it was to ride well in advance of his comrades and have fresh meat waiting on a likely camping spot when the band should come up in the evening the place is soon filled with the bustle and noise of eighty men and fifty horses the packers halting their animals on three sides of a square the fourth being the river uncinch the horses and place their packs on the ground so as to form a breastwork the horses roll in the cool grass grunting and whinnying by way of expressing their satisfaction now the horse guards take charge of the herd leading it to water and good grazing outside the camp meanwhile details from each mess are gathering dry wood and building fires while others are portioning out the meat and preparing it for supper those who have no special duties today have already stripped and are splashing and laughing boisterously in a pool nearby like the light-hearted boys that many of them are now the kettles are bubbling over the fires and the pleasant smell of meat is in the air the sun drops slowly behind the bluffs and a grateful shade falls cool and blue along the valley now at last the meal is ready and the men fall too with homeric appetites pipes are out and lit and some of the men had begun to sing when a scout came galloping up with a tail of rees he had caught sight of two indians peering down upon him from a bluff top an hour since and he was convinced that they were the spies of a war party that planned to attack under the cover of darkness the singing stopped the horse guards were called in and the horses securely staked within the hollow square while the men were assigned to their places behind the baggage the fires were put out and the soft starry august gloom deepened over the camp one man in each mess having been detailed for guard duty the rest were permitted to sleep with their loaded rifles beside them hour after hour passed and still as the watchmen peered into the darkness nothing moved for it was a windless night they heard the nipping and blowing of the contented horses now and then wolves howled or an owl screeched the sleepy stars swarmed westward and the dipper pointed midnight on the polar dial still nothing happened the sleepy watches grumbled to each other and in low undertones said uncomplimentary things of indians in general of the rees in particular and of colonel leavenworth for having failed to make a clean job of the late campaign another hour passed 
then one of the horses with head held high began to snort and blow the whole herd stopped grazing and with ears pricked forward stared up the starlit slope to the southward toward where a thicket of plum and bullberry loomed black somewhere not far off a horse neighed and the nervous herd answered in unison scarcely had each sentry wakened his mess with the one word injuns when there broke out of the hush the running crack of rifle fire and the wee you plunk of a flight of arrows falling all about the camp some trappers swore in a shrill note of pain then the mingled howl of many savage voices swept down the hillside and with the rumble of galloping hoofs the attack was launched upon the trappers how 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 on came the howling riders shadowy in the starlight and seeming the more formidable for their vagueness scarcely heard above the tumult of the terrified horses some of which had been struck by arrows the men behind the baggage were shouting to each other to wait until the foe was close only three or four rifles went off prematurely surely in a moment more the charge would sweep right over the camp the whole breastwork of baggage blazed and roared the shadowy ponies in front reared screaming some collapsed like figures in a dream and through the spreading smoke of the rifles the trappers hastily reloading saw the scattered war party flying back up the slope with a yell the white men leaped over the baggage and rushing in among the fallen indian ponies lifted the hair of the dead and wounded rees they came back with a half dozen scalps when the excitement had abated and an examination of the camp was made two trappers anderson and neil were found dead also the old veteran he of the many tales coolly announced that he had an arrow in his hump ribs that would have to be butchered out as he expressed it an operation which after lighting his pipe he underwent without an outcry several of the horses had been wounded and some would be lame in the morning while the herd was grazing outside the camp and the cooks were getting breakfast ready neil and anderson were buried the ceremony consisting of a prayer by jed smith who according to the consensus of opinion seemed most likely to be heard very little was said about the two for whom a permanent camp had been made there by the grand they had been out of luck and they were rubbed out so it was all that day and for two days thereafter the party pushed on up the river valley encountering no more indians evidently the rees had decided that henry's men asked too high a price for their animals and had therefore gone in search of a cheaper market the progress of the band was a bit slower now for the wounded horses did well to follow bareback and their packs were distributed among the rest of the herd that had been heavily laden from the start it was not until evening of the third day after the attack that misfortune came again the band had been toiling all day under a blazing sun hoping to reach the forks of the grand for the night encampment and as the time for halting drew near the men began to watch eagerly for hugh glass bend after bend was rounded and each bend brought a fresh disappointment the men began to grumble what could be the matter with old glass did he expect them to march all night without supper at length as the sun was nearing the horizon major henry called a halt and the men sullen at the prospect of supper without fresh meat began to make camp they had not gone far with their preparations however when young bridger who with fitzpatrick had been riding in advance that day came up at a brisk gallop and the trappers noting his haste leapt to the conclusion that they were in for another encounter with the rees but it was a very different tale that bridger had to tell he and fitzpatrick while riding near the forks of the river two hours since had pushed through a bullberry thicket near a spring and had come suddenly upon old glass lying as though dead with a bloody hunting knife beside him not far away lay the carcass of a grizzly bear the old man's face was all scraped off as bridger put it and when we lifted him one of his legs went wobbly and he groaned it was evident that the old hunter had been taken by surprise and had not been able to set his trigger for his gun was still loaded and the great gashes in the bear's neck chest and belly showed how hugh had fought doubtless he had dismounted to drink at the spring and his horse terrified by the grizzly had bolted we tried to put him on a horse said bridger 
but he screamed though he didn't seem to know nothing and so fitz said he'd stay with the old man while i came back it was of course impractical to move the whole party on to the forks at that late hour so the major sent two men back with bridger to watch over old glass until the main body should come up next day it was commonly believed in camp that night that the old man was done for but when the party arrived at the forks next morning he was still living though he had not regained consciousness what should be done as bridger had stated it was impossible to move him and certainly the whole expedition could not be delayed indefinitely while one man decided whether or not he was going to die finally two men were induced by the offer of a liberal reward to remain with the wounded man until he could be placed either on a horse or under the ground then the main body impatient at the delay because the way before them was long and the scarcity of horses made their progress slow struck out for the yellowstone over practically the same route that jed and baptiste had taken in june ill luck still followed henry scarcely had the party crossed the desolate country through which the upper waters of the little missouri run and entered the valley of the yellowstone when a large war party of indians thought to be gros ventre swooped down upon it during the brisk fight that followed four trappers were killed and several more horses were wounded during the evening of the day after the battle the two men who had been left to watch over old glass at the forks of the grand rode their fagged horses into camp and the saddle of the horse they led was empty few words were expected from them by their comrades they said they had remained at the forks four days then old hugh had gone under and had been decently buried they had brought all his fixins away with them including gun blanket powder horn knife and flint and steel the story they brought occasioned no surprise and little sorrow was directly expressed though many spoke kindly of the dead that night remembering much good of the gray-bearded old hunter how cool he had been in the refight the droll things he had said on such and such occasions feats of strength he had performed when a keel-boat had grounded on a bar and many lesser matters such as make men love men well the old fellow was rubbed out at last but it took a grizzly bear to do the job and that was something it would have been worth a year's wages to see that bear fight so it was you never knew when your time might come thereupon the camp slept pushing on down the yellowstone without meeting any further resistance henry arrived at his post to find that during his absence the blackfeet nasabones had driven off twenty-two of the horses he had left there within a few days after his arrival seven more were stolen by the assabones obviously the chances for successful operations in that vicinity were slight so the major decided to abandon the post and move back up the yellowstone into the country of the crows who owing to the hostility existing between them and the blackfeet generally welcomed the trappers not only as allies against their ancient foes but also as a ready source of ammunition furthermore the presence of edward rose who as has been noted had won a high place in the tribe would doubtless do much to ensure a friendly reception for the hitherto luckless band it will be remembered that twenty men were left in charge of the fort when henry descended the missouri to reinforce ashley's party below the re towns having set out from the mouth of the grand with eighty men and having lost seven on the way he now had ninety-three under his command a formidable party sadly hampered however by the insufficient number of its horses heartened by this new hope of a peaceful winter among a friendly people the trappers marched southwestward up the valley of the yellowstone for several days already there had been heavy night frosts and the flocks of blackbirds brawling in the thickets proclaimed the coming of the winter they were traveling now through a region of ready feasts bison and deer and antelope were plentiful and often topping a rise for a long gaze they saw great herds of what seemed at first to be mules and were elk every evening the hunters came in with goodly horse loads of fresh meat so that there was singing as the sun went down and in the warmth and glow of the embers the men remembered many tales then one day it seemed that bad luck like a huge cat had only been playing with them allowing a brief respite from care that the next pounce might be crushing toward evening the advance guard came galloping back to report a large war party of indians some two or three miles ahead 
grumbling and sullen the trappers began to prepare for another battle unsaddling the pack animals and making a breastwork of the baggage while they were thus engaged three indian horsemen suddenly appeared on a bluff top several hundred yards away they were making signs of peace and rose believing them to be crows mounted and rode toward them after having covered half the distance to the bluff he paused to exchange signs with the three strangers then pricking his horse he hastened to join those on the bluff top anxiously the camp watched the pantomime on the height where an animated confab was evidently in progress and there were many who questioned the loyalty of the ex-pirate might he not betray them to his adopted people that he might win more prestige with the tribe however henry who had known the man in the early days of the missouri fur company had no such fears rose galloped back at length bringing the best of news the three on the bluff had proven to be old friends of his members of a crow war party returning with many horses from a foray into the blackfoot country they welcomed the whites into their land and wished nothing better than to trade for they were in need of many things especially powder and ball with which to meet their enemies on the north when the crows came up and went into camp a short distance away that which had been reported as a large war party was seen to consist of no more than twenty-five braves but the horses they drove were many the night was given over to feasting and trade and through old rose as interpreter the trappers and indians exchanged tales of prowess backed upon both sides by an eloquent display of scalps blackfoot gros ventre re had the white men fought and did they hate the blackfeet with a big hate it was enough the crows would be friends forever in the morning when the two parties took up the march again both were richer and happier than on the day before though their combined wealth was no greater for the indians might now meet their foes with plenty of powder and the trappers with all the horses they could use were entering a friendly country rich in beaver end of chapter eight chapter nine of the splendid wayfaring by john g nyhart this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf jed wrestles with death it was now time for the fall hunt to begin and accordingly it was decided that a small party should strike southward along the eastern border of the crow country locating the richest beaver streams and trapping on the way while the main body should move on up the yellowstone to the mouth of the bighorn there to establish winter quarters at the mouth of the powder sixteen men were told off for this undertaking william l sublette being one of the number jed smith and thomas fitzpatrick were placed in command bidding farewell to their comrades these pushed southward up the valley of the powder beaver sign was fairly plentiful traps set in the evening generally yielded satisfactory returns in the morning and the better part of each afternoon was spent in skinning the catch and preparing the pelts travelling leisurely thus through a region where fresh meat could be procured with little difficulty the men worked contentedly toward the bighorn mountains that at length began to lift clearer and clearer in the southwest here indeed was life such as these young fellows had dreamed of in the humdrum of the settlements autumn brooded goldenly on the vast land of no restraint how glorious to be young and free for a week the party kept together then smith with five men struck out westward fitzpatrick with the balance of the trappers kept on up the valley hoping to fall in with the crow nation then on its fall buffalo hunt in the region between the headwaters of the powder and the north fork of the platte smith was to explore the country westward trapping on the upper reaches of the tongue and rosebud as he went and meet fitzpatrick returning by way of the bighorn whence the reunited bands should proceed to winter quarters on the yellowstone for several days smith and his men worked slowly up a small tributary stream that came down from the divide between the powder and the tongue and the hunting was good then one evening jed met with an accident that seemed likely to end his dream of the great mysterious white spaces beyond the rockies he had been setting a trap at the margin of the creek and was pushing up through the brush that fringed the bank when a huge hairy form towered growling above him there followed a period of torturing dreams and when he awoke it was night 
and he was lying beside a fire with his shadowy comrades leaning over him there was a roaring ache in his head and at intervals a stabbing pain shot through one of his hips he had been felled with a blow from a paw of a grizzly his thigh had been badly mangled and he was in a fair way to be rubbed out when his comrades who were setting traps in the vicinity had rushed to his rescue and killed the bear as in the case of old hugh glass it was plain enough that jed though conscious would be unable to travel for many days and that night it was decided that three of the party should go in pursuit of fitzpatrick the two others remaining to watch over the wounded man for several days after the departure of the three things went well enough in the camp by the nameless creek and though it was evident that jed's recovery would be slow and those signs of approaching winter were not lacking there seemed to be little reason for uneasiness the rees and blackfeet were far away and the gros ventres were doubtless hunting buffalo on the plains bordering the missouri deer and antelope abounded in the broken country round about so there would be no lack of fresh meat and jed's companions could profitably spend the time of waiting in collecting beaver pelts but one evening a half hour or so after the two men had gone upstream to set their traps leaving their horses staked near the camp jed heard a number of shots fired in rapid succession and a medley of wild cries the sounds came from the direction in which his comrades had gone considering the number of shots and voices there was but one conclusion to draw seizing his rifle and powder horn jed at the cost of excruciating pain dragged himself into the midst of a thicket nearby and waited breathlessly very soon there was a crashing of the brush upstream and a dozen indians in war paint came cantering down the creek catching sight of the camp and the three grazing horses the band halted dismounted and gabbling excitedly in a tongue that jed did not recognize proceeded to appropriate the animals and whatever articles of equipment that struck their fancy during this time several were poking about in the brush with the muzzles of their guns and jed had decided that his last hour on earth was about to end when at the command from one of the party they all leaped upon their horses and galloped off downstream but during the few moments when the camp was being looted the wounded man in the brush had seen that which told a tragic story two dripping scalps the hair of which he recognized only too well the dusk fell with a penetrating chill and the long and terrible night began jed crawled out of his hiding place and after much patient industry accompanied by torture he managed to gather together a small heap of dry twigs but though he had a flint and steel he struck no fire lest the indians camping in the vicinity might return the blankets had gone with the rest of the equipment and there in that chill immensity the sick man shivered thinking of his dead comrades and haunted with the most gloomy forebodings would fitzpatrick return that way before it was too late how many days would it take to die of starvation how many nights like this could one endure why endure the cold any longer why fear sudden death at the hands of savages with that slow death waiting at the end of many days and nights of suffering by and by in the wee hours of the morning he made a fire and heartened by its cheerful glow and warmth he thanked god that for all his woe he had not only his rifle knife and flint and steel but what was more the much-worn copy of the bible which he always carried in a pocket of his hunting shirt a practice which had occasioned considerable sly merriment among his less pious comrades for a while now he strove to read by the dancing light and his memory supplied what he could not follow with his eyes he is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain yea his soul draweth near to the grave and his life to the destroyers his flesh shall be fresher than a child's he shall return to the days of his youth he shall pray unto god and he will be favourable unto him jed fell into an uneasy sleep when he awoke the fire was out but the dawn had come in the new light the old sustaining faith came on him like a revelation god was in the world as much as ever and he would provide yonder ran pure water a tremendous blessing as for food doubtless his comrades had set traps nearby and there is much poorer food than beaver flesh 
having prayed earnestly for strength to endure the pain he was about to suffer he dragged himself along the bank keeping a sharp lookout for traps the first was empty and the second also appalled at the pain that his venture was costing him he lay still for some time nursing the forebodings of the night but at length prayer strengthened him and he began to drag himself again the third trap contained a beaver but it was an hour before jed succeeded in bringing it ashore by means of a forked branch cut from the brush it was nearly noon when he finished his breakfast and for hours he lay exhausted dreading the passing of the day then at length when the sun was nearing the western horizon he began to collect fuel for the night the next day he fasted for he found no beaver and still another day came and went without food game seemed suddenly to have deserted the region that his trial might be the greater he turned to the book for courage i will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help my help cometh from the lord which made heaven and earth the lord shall preserve thee from evil in the morning of the third day of fasting jed's prayers were answered he wakened suddenly rubbed his eyes and saw a buck deer drinking at the stream an easy rifle shot away without lifting his head he reached for the loaded gun that lay beside him and turning on his side took careful aim just behind the shoulder of the buck at the roar of the gun it went down floundering in the mud and then was still praising the goodness of god he feasted that day and having feasted he dragged himself up the torturing slope of a nearby hillock and lying there he searched the empty distances all day long nothing appeared but a flock of crows but answered prayer had enormously strengthened the old faith in him what if fitzpatrick did not return no man who knows god can be alone and a way would be made doubtless his hip would heal enough before the winter set in so that he might make his way alone to the mouth of the bighorn for three days he fed from the flesh of the buck keeping constant watch over a flock of crows that were bent upon robbing his larder and frightening them away whenever they swooped down then what remained of the meat went putrid and the crows in a noisy black cloud soon stripped the bones clean jed watched them and wondered how long it would be before they should be feasting on human flesh he spent the following two days upon the hillock without food once a herd of antelope appeared a half mile away for hours they remained in sight peacefully grazing then they disappeared the third day after his meat supply had failed he did not attempt to climb out of the creek bottom and somehow his prayers seemed feeble he thought much now of the home folks back in ashtabula ohio and there were times when he visualized them all with a startling clearness would he ever see them with his eyes again the lord is my shepherd he read i shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for thou art with me these words oft repeated added power to his prayers and during the fourth day after the crows had picked the carcass god seemed to hear again for three deer came down to the creek to drink some two hundred yards away but when jed took aim the mark danced about giddily he fired a jet of water arose ten yards short of the drinking animals that crashed through the brush and disappeared he turned to the book for strength with which to bear this disappointment thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies was he being mocked what had he done that the almighty should desert him earnestly now he implored forgiveness for his sins that he might die in peace and a soothing quiet came upon him the next day colonel keemley of the missouri fur company led by the three who had gone in search of fitzpatrick came riding up the creek with a band of trappers these were the survivors of the blackfoot disaster on prior's fork of the yellowstone during the previous spring when jones and immel had been slain by securing a blanket across two poles the ends of which were fastened to the pack saddles of two of the more docile horses a litter was made for jed whose wounds despite his lack of food had healed sufficiently to admit of travel 
pushing westward across the upper waters of the tongue keemley's party came to the camp of a roving band of cheyennes and there in a few days came fitzpatrick and his men they had met and travelled for some days with the crows who would soon return to the mouth of the bighorn for the winter fitzpatrick had conceived a big idea during his absence and riding beside the horse litter as the party travelled down the valley of the little bighorn toward winter quarters he and jed eagerly discussed plans for the spring expedition a crow chief had told how following up the sweet water which flows into the north fork of the platte one would come to a break in the wind river mountains through which one might travel as easily as over open prairie down to the siskidiagi as the indians called green river so plentiful were the beaver yonder the crow chief had said that traps were not needed one could knock over all one wanted with a club how this story must have fired the imagination of the wounded man here at last was news from the mysterious white spaces the gates to the world of his dream were about to swing wide a keen north wind was bringing the winter when they reached the yellowstone there near the mouth of the bighorn and not far from the abandoned post that manuel lisa had built sixteen years before snug winter quarters had been erected by henry's men shortly after the arrival of smith and fitzpatrick a party that had been sent northwest into the country of the blackfeet returned with more thrilling tales than beaver thus united again henry's men settled down for the winter trapping the streams of the region and trading with the crows who had come up from the south and pitched their skin lodges near by end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schampf. The Ghost. The New Year, eighteen twenty four, arrived in the midst of tremendous blizzards, and for weeks the trappers had nothing to do but eat, sleep, sing, clog to a voyageur's fiddling, and to swap yarns the latter occupation offered the best avenue of escape from tedium for man is so constituted that he is never really happy except when creative and yarning as these men understood it was at its best certainly much more than a memory exercise the craving for sensation during those shut-in days and nights together with the keen spirit of rivalry that grew up among the storytellers often spurred them on to splendid mendacities the old veteran from the southwest was perhaps the most successful practitioner of this primitive art owing partly no doubt to a native talent for being quite unashamed and partly to the fact that his alleged adventures were sufficiently remote both in time and space to give his imagination the proper focal length for seeing large was there any one present who had never heard of that terrible beast called the Cargagni? well the old veteran from the southwest had seen one with his own eyes and could describe it in every particular not only had he seen one but once when he and a companion were roasting a goat away down yonder near the spanish peaks a carcagni had come bounding into camp seized the meat from the fire and disappeared all with incredible speed with every question from his audience the old man's memory seemed to grow richer until the original version of the incident was no more than the simple music theme which the winds and strings and brasses chase wildly through the intricate mazes of an involved orchestration and what was the carcagni like well its hair was long coarse and black and had the peculiar property of growing longer coarser and blacker upon closer scrutiny as to general appearance this strange beast was a perfect wolf from the tip of its nose to its shoulders and thereafter it was a bear though it was far bigger than any bear that opponent had ever seen its cry was indescribable and was such as to strike terror into the stoutest heart however marvellous as the card cagney upon repeated examination proved to be the telling of this tale was the merest preliminary exercise for the old veteran his memory became more athletic and he recalled the munchies and what were the munchies why they were a tribe of white indians 
whiter than americans living away down yonder beyond the gila country the old veteran had met a man who had seen the munchies in fact the old veteran had seen them with his own eyes he had not only seen them he had lived in one of their huge cities for some months and he could testify to the fact that they were a highly civilized people it happened in this way perhaps the youngsters present hadn't heard of mcknight baird and chambers but doubtless the older men would remember how those gentlemen had set out from st louis on a trading expedition to santa fe in the spring of eighteen twelve well anyway the speaker had been induced by those gentlemen to accompany the party as hunter his great skill in that line having already rendered him famous as one might say upon entering the mexican country the party consisting of twelve men was seized by the spanish authorities and sent to prison in chihuahua there to remain until death it would appear but the speaker being an exceedingly clever man had contrived to escape in three or four distinct ways as the highly circumstantial narrative seemed to indicate once outside the prison the hero of his own story fled to the mountains to evade his pursuers for weeks he wandered about lost in the wilderness of mountains and having no weapon it began to appear that he would surely die of starvation then one day summoning all his powers in a last desperate effort he climbed to the top of a very high mountain and what did his hearers suppose he saw the old veteran was a master of dramatic pauses which served doubtless the double purpose of intensifying the interest of his audience and giving the narrator an opportunity to recall any episode that owing to the well-known carelessness of chance might have failed to happen well on its further side that mountain range dropped sheer a thousand feet or more to a fertile cup-like valley apparently hemmed in on all sides by a giddy precipice and lo spread out on the valley floor was a vast city with spires and domes that shone in the sun yonder was food at last but how to reach it all the rest of that day the narrator of the tale sought in vain for a means of descent and next day he continued his search until in mid-afternoon he came to a ragged fissure in the cliff down which by dint of native cleverness and prodigious strength he managed to make his way he found the plain to be far vaster in extent than he had supposed and the city itself proportionately larger so that it was not until the next morning that he reached his destination though he continued to travel most of the night the munchies for it was their city that had been seen from the top of the mountain appeared to be unaware that any other human beings existed and they received the starved trapper as a god processions and feasts were the order of the day housed in a huge temple where he was daily adored by thousands the old trapper grew fat and dissatisfied had he only been treated as a human being he might have been there yet the contented father of a brood of munchies but being a god soon wearied him and he began to yearn for the old free life accordingly one dark night he made his escape reaching the fissure in the cliff just at the white of dawn he climbed all that day and when at sunset he stood on the crest of the mountains he could see the whole munchy population rushing wildly about the plain like a colony of agitated ants the narrator had at the time intended to return not alone to be sure but with a dozen hardy fellows properly armed the munchies were rich beyond calculation even the poorest citizens eating from plates of solid gold furthermore being vegetarians because there were no wild animals in their valley and having no word for enemy in their vocabulary they were without weapons of any sort the business possibilities were certainly very inviting and why hadn't the old veteran gone back well he had tried to go back two years later and a score of others with him for months he and his companions had climbed lofty peaks looking for the city of the munchies but in vain who were the munchies and whence came they that was indeed a puzzling matter but the narrator having brought a munchy coin away with him once showed the same to a priest who declared that the inscription thereon was in the best latin doubtless the munchies were descendants of a small band of roman adventurers who having crossed the atlantic something like fifteen hundred years before columbus 
had been lost in the wilderness the coin the old veteran regretted exceedingly to report that he had lost the coin some years back under circumstances involving a clash with hostile indians which reminded him of another story well calculated to discourage any further questioning with reference to the mysterious city lost forever in the wilds of chihuahua so mounting to the greater audacity by way of the lesser the old veteran often reached dizzy pinnacles of improvisation entertaining himself quite as much as his comrades but there is in this cosmos of ours a story-making agency that at times though working only in the raw stuff of facts outdoes man's boldest fictions that agency is known as chance the least sensitive prevaricator feels it incumbent upon himself to give even his wildest yarns some semblance of plausibility which is a matter of logical sequences but chance being unhuman is under no compulsion to be plausible and is apparently subject only to that weird super logic of events the course of which is non-predictable by any mental process a story thus created does not woo credence step by step it simply overwhelms incredulity with the impossible accomplished and leaves the critic grasping the broken chain of his logic now a masterpiece of disorder had been in preparation ever since the westbound party had passed the forks of the grand river during the previous august and so audaciously improbable was the tale that had it been told by the old veteran of the southwest it would probably have been received with hilarious laughter for all the sadness of it it happened thus the blizzards that had ushered in the new year eighteen twenty four had ceased at last and a great white calm had fallen on the wilderness it was now nearly february and men were beginning to look forward to the renewed activity of the spring hunt and fitzpatrick's plans for pushing westward through the pass of which the crows had told him into the mysterious beaver country whence all streams sought the pacific furnished an enthralling topic for conversation even the crows had not penetrated far into the region now about to be visited it seemed somewhat like planning a trip to the other side of the moon night had fallen and the hush of intense cold was upon the white waste a merry fire roared on the hearth in the big trading room where the men were lounging old baptiste was making the major's fiddle laugh and weep and often when his bow swung into some old southern jig tune the younger fellows would step it lively aping the negro dancers away down yonder on the plantations that used to be home by and by in a momentary hush the stockade gate was heard to rattle at its bar as though a sudden wind had shaken it yet there was no wind the men listened a while but heard only the howling of the wolves and the fort timbers popping in the great freeze the music began again and a youth swinging into an extravagant negro clog aroused a roar of laughter again the music stopped and scarcely had the silence returned when a wild hoarse cry arose outside some crow indian was there at the gate no doubt but what could he want a trapper got up went out into the snow that whined under his moccasins and followed by the candle glimmer that spilled through the open door went to the gate and raised the wicket through which trading was sometimes carried on immediately those inside heard the wicket clatter down and with a look of terror on his face the trapper dashed back into the room and slammed the door i i i saw he stammered saw what asked the major old glass whispered the trapper all white his ghost fiddlestick said the major getting up from his bench by the fire he went out into the starlit silence and the men thronged to the door the dry snow fifed to his stride the chain clanked the gate swung wide and then the impossible came to pass the men saw henry walking backward and after him came no other than hugh glass who had died yonder at the forks of the grand and was buried there his hair that swept his shoulders and his long gray beard matted upon his chest were ghostly with his frozen breath the men gave way at the door and henry backed in followed by the spectre and what a face it had 
grotesquely blurred as though seen reflected in ruffled water the old man stalked boldly into the middle of the room with his long rifle under his arm and stared about him my god gasped the major two men saw you die at the forks of the grand the old man's chest rumbled with unpleasant laughter show me these men who have seen so much he said either they lie here or i lie there i'm not half sure myself yonder is one said henry hugh turned to where a trapper crouched against the wall with abject terror in his eyes for a brief moment the ruined face of the old man was as though a blizzard swept across it he set the trigger of his gun and clicked the lock then his face softened and easing the hammer down he strove over to the groveling man and kicked him lightly get up and wag your tail said he i wouldn't kill a pup where's the other one who saw me die the other one had gone to fort atkinson with dispatches before the snows had come and the other one proved to be a youth whom hugh had loved and befriended well well remarked the man who had just returned from the grave it's a long way i've travelled if yonder gentleman has spoken truth so put on the pot and you will see what an appetite a ghost can have and having eaten with a wolfish hunger the old man told the story of his resurrection he could not say how long he had lain there by the spring but by and by he awoke and managed to get his eyes open it was some time before he could realize what had happened to him then he knew by the footprints of horses all about him that the main party had been there and gone on the ash heap of an old fire however showed that major henry had not intended to desert him some of his comrades had been left behind to care for him but where were they and where were his fixins not even so much as a knife had been left him the more he thought about the matter the greater grew his anger and he swore that he would live that he might avenge that treachery deliberately he set about the difficult business of getting well enough to travel the spring furnished plenty of good water and over it hung a bush full of ripe bullberries also with his teeth he was able to tear flesh from the gashed body of the bear but the meat had begun to spoil and soon he had only the fruit and what bread root he could find in the vicinity after some days of waiting he decided that his leg which seemed to have been broken was hardly likely to carry him for some weeks so he thought it well to begin his journey at once by crawling fort kiowa the nearest post on the missouri was over a hundred miles away after weeks of well-nigh incredible hardships sorely wounded and without weapons he had succeeded in reaching the post shortly afterward still intent upon revenge he had joined a keelboat party bound for the mouth of the yellowstone but at the mandan villages the ice had closed in still driven by his wrath he had pushed on alone through the winter wilderness and here he was at the mouth of the bighorn the wrath that had given him strength to survive was now concentrated upon the friend who had robbed and deserted him and within a few weeks he set out again riding southward by way of the powder to the platte eastward to the neobrera down that stream to its mouth and thence by the valley of the missouri to fort atkinson but the treacherous friend had gone upstream and hugh followed if when the long pursuit was ended hugh had wrought vengeance upon his youthful betrayer his adventure would have been little more than an astonishing exhibition of brute endurance and ferocity but in the end the greybeard forgave and that fact raises his story to the level of sublimity end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The First White Men Through South Pass. Late in February of eighteen twenty four, the monotonous days of the winter bound party at the mouth of the Bighorn came to an end at last. A small band of trappers, including Hugh Glass, still obsessed with the desire for revenge started with dispatches for fort atkinson and those who remained soon after began the spring hunt trapping on the tributaries of the yellowstone in the vicinity of the fort meanwhile waiting for the first authentic signs of spring 
thomas fitzpatrick and jedediah smith were making ready for the much discussed journey across the great divide into the mysterious beaver country of which the crows had given so glowing an account during the previous fall it was agreed with the major that they should undertake this expedition as free trappers the necessary outfit to be furnished on credit by the firm of ashley and henry and to be paid for out of the proceeds of the enterprise a fact which made the young adventurers all the more eager to put their fortune to the test the snow was softening in a south wind and up the lower reaches of the sunward slopes a pale green glow was filtering through the yellow buffalo grass the day they rode away from the fort and disappeared up the valley of the bighorn it must have been good to see them riding forth that day a score of hardy young men wearing the savage garb of the wilderness well mounted and driving with them a string of laden pack-horses day after day they pushed on steadily up the valley making but moderate progress for the winter had been a hard one and forage for the horses had been scanty in the vicinity of the fort nor did they seem to be riding toward the spring though they were headed that way for the land was rising rapidly and the increasing altitude offset their southward progress so that the ponies nosing for the first green shoots still tasted snow to their left and ahead arose the dazzling summits of the bighorn mountains and to their right the continental divide was like an irregular bank of glittering cloud floating up with an imperceptible west wind they came at length to the base of the mountains where the bighorn river issues from a canyon and began the crossing of the range by a route that came to be known among trappers as bad pass and that was described by irving who got his information from captain bonneville as rugged and frightful at this early season the passage must have been especially difficult and doubtless two or three days were spent in crossing though the length of the canyon by which the river breaks through is only thirty miles upon emerging from the mountains they found themselves in the pleasant valley of the wind river which rising in the wind river mountains flows southeastward then northward and after breaking through the range that has just been crossed becomes the bighorn here on the ninth of september thirteen years before had arrived the astorians under w p hunt traveling overland from the reed villages on the missouri to the mouth of the columbia from this point hunt's trail had led up the wind river through a difficult pass near jackson's hole but according to the information that fitzpatrick had received from the crows he should here strike southward to the sweetwater which if followed to its source would lead to the easy open gateway of a country rich in beaver during the ascent of the bighorn and the crossing of the mountains it had become evident that at least half of the horses were too poor to be relied upon for any difficult going that might be encountered farther on and it was decided that a half dozen men under smith who no doubt still felt the effects of his wounds should remain for a time on the wind river with the weaker horses later crossing with them to the sweetwater there to await the exploring party's return from the west during the summer accordingly near the mouth of the popoegi a tributary of the wind river smith went into camp and fitzpatrick with fourteen men and about twenty-five of the stronger horses pushed on southward up the valley of the little tributary very soon after leaving smith the wisdom of the late decision became apparent to fitzpatrick for he found himself in a confusion of hills and cliffs of red sandstone some peaked and angular some round some broken into crags and precipices and piled up in fantastic masses but all naked and sterile emerging from this grotesque world and traveling as rapidly as possible through a broken sagebrush country where the banks of the creeks were often crusted white with saline deposits they came at last with horses half starved and fagged to a clear pure stream flowing swiftly eastward over a rocky bed through a fine valley dotted here and there with clumps of cottonwood scrub oak and aspen it was the sweet water the origin of whose name would seem to be obvious considering the purity of the stream as contrasted with the saline character of the creeks in the surrounding region wherever the snow swept thin by the winds had begun to melt in the noon suns 
a rich growth of buffalo grass well cured during the winter furnished excellent pasturage and the party spent several days in camp here that the animals might recruit their strength for the journey across the great divide to westward the wind river mountains ran like a broken white wall along the horizon and the men remembering their recent experiences in the bighorn range talked much of the difficulties that might be encountered yonder at this time of the year for the snow would still be lying deep in the lofty passes would it not be better to wait until the spring thaw had cleared the way but fitzpatrick eager to enter the promised land of which the crows had spoken and trusting in what the chief had told him as to the ease with which the mountains could be crossed chose to push on without further delay setting out up the valley of the sweetwater they travelled all day over a natural road no portion of which would have offered any serious obstacle to loaded wagons sometimes the valley spread to a width of three or four miles sometimes it narrowed to a few rods but always the way was fairly easy and the rise of the land toward the divide was scarcely perceptible save that the air grew steadily colder and the snow deepened as the party proceeded that night the sky was like frosty steel and the stars like broken glass breaking camp in the white of the dawn they pushed on again and more and more as they went their horses floundered in the crusted snow the sweet water dwindled to a little creek voiceless in the grip of the winter that lingered there and the noon was like a midwinter noon they toiled on over a high rolling prairie the ponies frosty muzzled and frosty flanked the men's beards whitened with their breath by and by the sweet water had disappeared for some time the band toiled on silently save for the blowing of the horses and the crunching of the crusted snow then someone cried look look long vistas of a vast undulating plain had opened out ahead and here and there in the distance lofty buttes some flat-topped like islands deserted by the sea some carved by wind and rain into towers and domes seemed staring round them at the immense scope and loneliness of the surrounding world it was the promised land of the Siskadiagi, and already they were on the westward slope of the divide the shout that arose from the band died without echo in that vastness and the sympathetic neighing of the horses was a feeble sound now as they floundered on they noted that the air grew somewhat warmer despite the waning of the afternoon signs of noonday melting began to appear shortly before sundown they came upon a living spring where they went into camp and spent a cheerless night for there was no wood in the vicinity but the wind-swept spaces about the spring furnished some scanty grazing for the horses which was the matter of chief importance all the next forenoon as they pushed on in a southwesterly direction signs of spring became increasingly evident yesterday morning it was january today it was late march the grass had begun to sprout and the willow buds were swelling slightly when they came in the late afternoon to a creek the bed of which was some fifteen or twenty feet wide they were now on the little sandy the waters of which reached the gulf of california by way of the colorado and they had just come through south pass the first white men of all the thousands upon thousands that would pass that way when the oregon and california trail should become like a great river of home-seeking humanity that night by a cheerful fire fitzpatrick indulged in what must have seemed extravagant prophecy to many of his companions telling how ox-drawn wagons would one day be seen trundling up the valleys of the platte and the sweet water to this place thence to the headwaters of the columbia and down that river to the sea little did he dream then said an old chronicler that he himself twenty years after would encamp in that passage with the first train of american emigrants destined to the new land beyond and who were not only carrying along their wagons but all the household necessaries for furnishing their new homes end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Splendid Wayfaring by John G. Nyhart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Treasure and the Trouble Therewith. 
moving on down the creek to its junction with the big sandy and following the latter to its mouth through an arid country fitzpatrick's party and the full tide of spring reached the green river together the long-leafed cottonwoods and the box elders that grew along the river banks and on occasional islands were leafing out and late april was moving like a pale green vapor through the willow thickets food for man and beast was plentiful here but the beaver everywhere felled cottonwoods dams and dome-shaped lodges proclaimed the wealth of the country and the men set to work in high glee for none among them had ever before seen a country so rich in fur certainly the crow chief had not been over eloquent in his description of this paradise of the trapper joseph meek a famous mountain man has left us the following account of the manner in which the trapper took his game he has an ordinary steel trap weighing five pounds attached to a chain five feet long with a swivel and a ring at the end which plays round what is called the float a dry stick of wood about six feet long the trapper wades out into the stream which is shallow and cuts with his knife a bed for his trap five or six inches under the water he then takes the float out the whole length of the chain in the direction of the center of the stream and drives it in so fast that the beaver cannot draw it out at the same time tying the other end by a thong to the bank a small stick or twig dipped in musk or castor found in certain glands of the beaver served for bait and is placed so as to hang directly above the trap which is now set the trapper then throws water plentifully over the adjacent bank to conceal any footprints or scent by which the beaver would be alarmed and going to some distance wades out of the stream in setting a trap certain things are to be observed with care first that the trap is firmly fixed and at the proper distance from the bank for if the beaver can get on shore with the trap he will cut off his foot to escape second that the float is of dry wood for should it not be the animal will cut it off at a stroke and swimming with the trap to the middle of the dam be drowned by its weight in the latter case when the hunter visits his trap in the morning he is under the necessity of plunging into the water and swimming out to dive for his game should the morning be frosty and chilly as it very frequently is in the mountains diving for traps is not a pleasant exercise in placing the bait care must be taken to fix it just where the beaver in reaching it will spring the trap if the bait stick be placed high the hind foot of the beaver will be caught if low the forefoot in this manner fitzpatrick's men were now employed in the reaping of the rich harvest though often the beaver were so plentiful that they were shot from the cover of the willows while the greater portion of the band was engaged in hunting several of the men were left in camp to skin the catch dry the hides and form them into packs each weighing about one hundred pounds and containing about sixty pelts within a week after arriving in the green river country the party had taken enough fur to make four packs still as they proceeded slowly down the stream working the tributaries the supply seemed inexhaustible and beaver selling in st louis at about six dollars per pound one needs but little imagination to realize with what high spirits those young men pushed the work another week passed still the pelts accumulated amazingly and every night brought feasting and jollity within a month at most the band would be starting for the pass to join smith's party at the rendezvous on the sweetwater and what a tale there would be to tell all the while the busy trappers had come upon no indian sign they seemed to be the only human beings in all that vast country though they knew from the crows that the tribe of snakes claimed the land westward from the pass for some days after their arrival at the hunting grounds the party had rigidly followed henry's plan for making camp in a hostile territory but soon the apparent loneliness of the region together with the expansive mood of success induced laxness of late the practice of bringing the horses within the enclosure of the camp at sunset had been discontinued and four horse guards were deemed sufficient to watch the herd grazing out the night in the lush bottoms near the sleeping trappers now an ancient greek would say that these men had fallen into the great sin of hubris 
being drunk with good fortune and no longer mindful of that humility which is befitting to the state of mere mortals however that may be there came a night when their surprising run of luck was rudely broken as will now appear they had camped in a bend of the river where the valley broadened out rising westward by an easy grade to a great arid plain the fires that had burned merrily in the evening while the men took their ease smoking and yarning luxuriously had fallen low and those on watch heard the snoring of the sleepers the night wind rustling the cottonwoods and mumbling in the willows the contented horses blowing and stamping as they nosed the fat pasture the stars swarmed up out of the dark hollow of the world and drifted over the mysterious immensity showering the stuff of slumber a stricken flint spurted out yonder and the momentary glow of a horse guard's pipe painted a weathered face upon the gloom a cotton-like fog crawled over the river and the night air was tanged with a hint of frost hours passed and the wheeling heavens had yet three hours to bring the dawn when the night was suddenly filled with yelling and the sound of many galloping hoofs thus rudely shaken out of deep sleep the trappers leaped to their feet dashing about the camp in bewilderment and shouting unanswered questions some of the less excitable men seized their rifles and fired into the whirlwind of shadowy horsemen that swept by waving hide robes about their heads and howling as they circled about the panic-stricken herd and sent it stampeding up the westward slope it was all over before the white men fully realized what was happening the flying shadows disappeared over the rise and dumbfounded the trappers stood there listening to the lessening roll of their horses hoofs out yonder on the plain here was a pretty fix indeed had the horse guards fallen asleep that mattered little now what mattered was the fact that the snakes had robbed them of their horses and what good was all this wealth without means of transporting it over the divide they slept no more that night but replenishing the fallen fires sat down to discuss their predicament with many a lusty oath no one had been hurt a fact which left some room for optimism many of the wilder spirits were in favor of starting at once in pursuit of the animals but fitzpatrick saw the matter in a different light here was plenty of beaver and since they had come for beaver why not continue the hunt while the fur was good and until they had all they wanted of the precious stuff at worst they could cash their packs return on foot to the sweet water and get more horses from the crows when morning came the rich yield of the traps served to popularize fitzpatrick's plan and all agreed that there would be time enough to think about horses when the matter of beaver pelts had been satisfactorily handled further immunity from attack by the natives of the country was fairly certain henceforth since the snakes had already taken what they wanted and would hardly be likely to return out of sheer wantonness so not only with enthusiasm unabated but with a heightened sense of adventure the men went on with the trapping the snakes however remained the common topic of discussion about the evening fires and more and more as the time drew near when the need of horses should become pressing the trappers talked of reprisal not only was it a long way back to the sweet water but the horses that smith had there would scarcely be sufficient for the need as for the crows there was no telling where they might be with their herds during the summer away over yonder at the powder's mouth as like as not why cross the divide hadn't the snakes at least twenty-five good horses also weren't fourteen well-armed white men as good as a whole village of yonder rascals also wouldn't it be good policy to acquaint the snakes with the temper of the trapping breed that future operations in the country might be attended with less annoyance the audacious proposal steadily gained ground among the men until it dominated the camp for as a matter of fact the rank and file of the band were far less concerned with beaver than with adventure and here was a glorious opportunity for laying up some memories against the time when old age should make action impossible so when twenty packs of beaver were made up it happened that the band made ready for an expedition against the snake tribe this involved the making of a cache for the furs and equipment which was done in the following manner choosing a dry place in the midst of a thicket they dug a pit six feet in diameter and eight feet deep 
from this a drift was run back sufficiently large to accommodate all the impedimenta of the party the excavation was then carefully lined with sticks and dry grass after which the goods were carefully packed within the opening to the drift covered with a layer of willows and grass and the hole filled in order that the cache might not be discovered and lifted by some wandering band of indians every particle of soil that remained was gathered up and dumped into the river and great care was given to the replacing of the grass just as it had been before the digging certain bluffs observed in relation to the spot served as markers and the number of days of travel from thence to the mouth of the big sandy would determine the general locality of the cache having thus disposed of their baggage and carrying nothing but their rifles ammunition and the smaller necessary articles of a trapper's equipment known as possibles the band started out on the trail of the snakes which led in a northerly direction over the arid plain there had been no rain since the night attack and the hooves of fifty horses there could have been no less counting those of the indians had left no doubtful record of their passing after five long days of marching the band reached the mouth of the sandy and still the trail led on skirting the green river it was noted that at this point the indians had begun to travel in a leisurely manner for the trappers though afoot easily covered in a day the distance from one camping ground to another and it became the common opinion that the snake village could not be far away accordingly from this point onward the party spent the day camping in some concealed place and moved by night for the moon was full now and the trail was still easy to follow three nights they pushed on up the green after leaving the big sandy's mouth marching from dusk to dawn then during the fourth night when the moon in mid-heaven was flooding the huge spaces with that purple glow that one sees only in the high dry countries and in the staging of a melodrama the scouts travelling a half hour in advance of the party brought back a bit of news that set all hearts pounding scarcely more than a mile ahead they had looked down from a bluff upon an indian encampment they had counted twenty lodges there in an open space near the river and they judged that no less than one hundred horses were grazing along the bottom on the far side of the herd the brush seemed to be quite dense by passing the village and approaching the grazing horses through the brush the scouts judged that it would be possible for each man to capture and mount an animal without arousing the indians then the whole herd could be stampeded right through the village and up an adjoining slope into the open country after holding a council of war the trappers pushed on cautiously upstream the scouts leading the way soon they caught the faint smell of smouldering fires and making a wide detour they passed the encampment descended into the brushy valley beyond and crawled southward until they came to the edge of the thicket there within a stone's throw was the snake herd peacefully grazing and fortunately owing to the lie of the land the animals were well bunched farther on at a distance of two or three hundred yards was the dusky clutter of skin lodges vaguely illumined here and there by glowing embers and beyond that where the valley turned abruptly eastward bare bluffs sloped gradually to the plain above evidently it had not occurred to the indians that the white men might come afoot after their horses and doubtless they knew that their ancient enemies the blackfeet were hunting far away on the missouri the full moon clearly revealed the peaceful scene and as the men lay there considering the situation they gloated in whispers over the line prospect for a clean sweep of the herd even the dogs had not yet sensed danger and if any of the indians were awake there was nothing to indicate the fact now swinging their loaded rifles at their backs by means of thongs that had been prepared for this particular moment the trappers crept on all fours out into the open and approached the herd several of the nearer horses with heads held high ears pricked forward and tails raised snorted alarm and forthwith the herd crowded together and began to mill a dog barked in the village now was the time leaping to their feet the trappers rushed to the nearest bunch of jostling snorting animals and it was a tense moment during which each man seizing the mane of a horse scrambled to its back knowing well what fate he might expect if he failed 
then arose a yell that sent the herd thundering toward the encampment and after it came the mounted trappers howling defiance at the rudely awakened foe right on through the village rushed the frightened horses making havoc among the lodges as they went and after them rode fitzpatrick's men discharging their rifles as they dashed through the population of the town now swarming into the open shrieking squaws crying children shouting braves barking dogs on up the slope beyond the stampede thundered and but a few minutes elapsed between the time of mounting and the moment when topping the ridge amid a tempest of flying manes the victors saw before them the dusky plain weird under the moon it was an hour before the horses fagged with a long run fell into a jog trot and became manageable morning came and still fitzpatrick's men pushed on southward with the herd nor did they venture to camp until the evening shadows began to deepen along the river valley many of the horses had strayed from the herd during the wild night run and some of those would doubtless be picked up by the snakes before long therefore haste was still necessary and at midnight the trappers set out again into the south by riding the greater part of both night and day they arrived safely at the cache during the third evening from the indian village they now had forty horses in place of the twenty-five so unceremoniously borrowed by the snakes a goodly increase on the original investment end of chapter twelve